Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Alumni Fellows presentation, Conversations with OSU Influencers. My name is Hallie Baker, and I am a student in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, studying kinesiology with minors in political science and Spanish. Today, we will hear from Alumni Fellow, Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, who will be introduced by Javier Nieto, the Dean of the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. On behalf of all of us today, I would like to thank the Alumni Association for producing this webcast and for establishing the Alumni Fellows Program. After the presentation, please join us for a question and answer session. Submit your questions by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your browser window. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted online at osualum.com forward slash fellows. Please welcome Javier Nieto to introduce our OSU Alumni Fellow, Dr. Rebecca Hernandez. Thank you, uh, Holly, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, the College of Public Health and Human Sciences selected Dr. Rebecca Hernandez as our 2020 Alumni Fellow to honor her transformational work to advance social justice in higher education. Dr. Hernandez earned her PhD in Human Development and Family Studies at OSU in 2005, and is currently Associate Provost for Local and Global Engagement and Chief Diversity Officer at George Fox University in Newark, Oregon, where she has developed a robust diversity plan that includes all aspects of university life. Before Fox, she held the position of Associate Dean of Intercultural Development and Educational Partnerships at Goshen College, where she taught courses in leadership in intercultural organizations and social action. She was the invited feature speaker at Southwestern College Annual Convocation in 2018. Incorporating the voices of diverse populations um, has always been central to her research, teaching and practice. Before she began her career in higher education, she was a community organizer for Hacienda Community Development Corporation, where she forged bonds with the community that improved the health and well being of urban and rural Oregonians. At this moment, as we recognize that systemic racism is a public health crisis and that OSU has work to do in the areas of social justice. There is no better representative of our college vision of lifelong health and well being for every person, every family, every community. Please welcome Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, the 2020 Alumni Fellow for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Thank you, Dr. Nieto. I appreciate that. Well, first of all, let me thank the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Uh, OSU has been a, is my alum, uh, is my home in lots of ways. I think the work that OSU has been doing on many fronts has been uh, life-changing for many, many of our community members. So I thank OSU for this honor and for this opportunity to share with you. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. And then I'm very eager to talk in the open forum in the, uh, question and answer time, so please feel free to add that. I thank all the viewers who are watching, many of our friends who I've begged to come on and make sure I'm not alone in this, so thank you all who've been here, who are joining us today. I also wanna add a little bit about myself. I started out as a practitioner, as, as Dr. Nieto mentioned, and then I went on to get my PhD a little, what, the, what I was called a um, older than average or a non-traditional student. I think is the new term today, but frankly, I was older. And by doing that, I was able to bring my work experience, my life experience into my uh, doctoral program. And from there, melding the two, practitioner researcher is really what I wanna focus on today. And then what that means to our work in social justice. So with that, we'll start with the first slide. Let me switch over to slides. So this first slide is really the topic of our conversation today. Researcher as practitioner, practitioner as researcher. One of the most important things that I can tell you about being both a researcher and a practitioner is that I think we need both in the world. The reality is that research that doesn't impact people, I don't know this is helpful as we would want it to be. So one of the things that I appreciated about OSU and specifically 
uh, my mentor there, Dr. Clara Pratt, who's on the call today, so thank you, Clara, was the idea that there wasn't one track for students at OSU, that the track of being a PhD student was not just to be a, a faculty member, which is a, a fine goal, and we have obviously lots of fine researchers. The other part was that you could also think about being a practitioner, and the idea of doing those two together was really important to me. I wanted to bring back the research that we used, that we learned about, the things that we learned to back to impact people at the home front. So I'm gonna go through one example, and this is not by means everything, but it's just one example of the kind of work that I've done in the past and continue to do even now as an associate provost. So the next slide is really this. So what are the social determinants of health disparities among Latinos in the US? That's been a question I've been asking for a really long time. So we've looked in my work, I've done work on domestic violence, on issues of access around housing, affordable housing, and the neighborhoods in which these um, affordable housing, housing is located, <clears throat> communities of color, specifically immigrant populations, and uh, in Latinos in the US. So thinking about that, we also began to look at, and I say we, meaning I have always done this work with other folks, the looking at the, at the birth rate, the maternal health of women, Latino women, immigrant women, et cetera. So all of these have been really a part of what I've done, but then I really began to go back into college access. For me, I believe college has changed my life. I'm a first generation college student, as many of you may be. And the idea of changing the trajectory of my entire family has made a difference, not only in my life, but in the life of my siblings, nieces, nephews, and in my own father, who passed several years ago. But he was always a part of my research. He was always a part of my life as a practitioner. So for him, Diodoro Hernandez, I um, offer these, these insights for today. I hope they're insightful to you. So first of all, looking at college access for Latinos. On the left are the ideas that we would do as a researcher. So there are many things that we can research around college access. And many, much has been written. So you're not gonna see a lot of citations here. There's a lot of material that I can point you to and that others can point you to as well. But one of the big things has been, how do we think about a systemic process of recruiting and helping Latino students access college, not only get through college, successfully, but then also launch into economic mobility that helps them and their families move forward in a different way. So at Goshen College, which is a small uh, faith-based institution in Northern Indiana, Lilly Endowment gave them a grant for $12.5 million back in 2008. So at that time, they had this check, this money, and a very, very small school, under 1,000 students, and a growing Latino population that had come to work in the uh, manufacturing of RVs and those sorts of, and the uh, support materials around that. That community was growing at 300% Latinos over about a 10 year period. Now there were obviously proponents of immigrants in the community and there were those who were detractors and felt that they were not welcomed. So one of the interesting things about the Midwest, and you can do some research around this if you're interested, is that immigrant populations have helped keep uh, many, many communities in the Midwest going when lots of students, lots of children of people who lived in Indiana, in the Midwest and other states have moved out. So this in migration has actually helped many communities to stay vibrant and afloat. But Others have chosen, other communities have chosen to close their doors to immigrants and they have, uh, they themselves have dissipated or disappeared or even reduced in their community numbers and in their vitality as a community. So one of the things that we focused on in Goshen was thinking about what is a college going culture? What does it mean to develop a college going culture? There's a lot of literature about this. And one of the things that we did both as practitioner and researcher was to develop a partnership with the school districts in the community, the school district, excuse me, and the schools within that community to say, how do we help build a college going culture so that every student in any, any classroom could know that college was a was the potential for them. That in itself is a whole lot of research and there's materials that we've written on, there are papers, et cetera, that we've worked on 
talking about just of the college going culture. Now, our small contribution to the literature was may have been small, but for a small community like Goshen, it was life changing. It has really begun to change the direction of that particular college, and it has begun to change the, the community itself around the idea of college going. So as researchers, we studied it, but also as some of us within that grant, we're also practitioners, so building it. How do you do that? Is that does that mean research is the fore, foreground of the picture, or is it the background? Or does it, does it go back and forth? And I think it does. It goes back and forth depending on where you sit in that process. Culturally, also, culturally specific recruitment. Knowing that diverse communities recruit are needed to be recruited differently, I think we're all learning that. Many people have, many colleges and universities have been studying this, have been looking at this, have been learning about this. Here at George Fox, where I am today in Newburgh, we have actually worked really hard to connect with our communities, to work with partners, community partners, to think about how we recruit and retain students of color, diverse students into our small faith-based institution. Again, I don't think it's much different for state institutions that that sense of connection to the communities, that sense of, of understanding communities and building relationships with partners is pretty critical. But all of that brings the student to our doors, but that doesn't keep them here. The literature talks about that many of our students, 80% of students, uh, Latino students, feel like they want to go to college. You can go into any high school classroom and say, hey, who's going to college? Many, many hands will go up. But getting them here to the door is another process, and we lose many along the way because they don't know what the process is like or what they're supposed to do to even get here. One example that I use, have used in the past and I'll give you now is my own nephew who was going, wanted to go to college, had been recruited at Goshen. I was trying to keep a very professional separation from that. But finally his college uh, admissions person asked me, hey, you know, I've been talking to your nephew and I'm not getting the materials I need from him. So I, of course, being someone who's made it through to a PhD forgot what that was like and was kind of uh, embarrassed and a little uh, frustrated with my nephew. So I called him and said, hey, have you gotten these materials for this? Why haven't you gotten this? He said, I have them. I have, I told him over and over again that I have these papers that he wanted, these transcripts, this material. And then it, all of a sudden it hit me. I asked the question, did he ask you to mail it to him? And he said, no, he just told me I had to have them. So I have them. I thought I would just bring them when I came. So even that simple ask of that step of not being asked to mail them ahead of time, to mail them as a part of the application process was pretty daunting for him. He didn't know what he didn't know. And for our recruiter, he didn't know what he didn't know either. So that piece is really critical. Understanding, getting some cultural knowledge about the recruitment or about the community you're working with is pretty important. But then they come. What we've heard and what we've seen and what the literature tells us is that a sense of belonging is very critical for all students. How it manifests itself though is very different for different communities. So for Latino community, seeing someone like themselves, for the African-American community, for other diverse communities, seeing someone in, their, in the administration, seeing faculty members, especially faculty members who look like them, who have experiences like theirs, even first generation students, these help them to build a sense of belonging. If that person could do it, then I can do it as well. That's why for us here at Fox, our number one goal has been to recruit diverse faculty. And in the last five, seven years, we've actually moved from a less than 8% to 20% of our faculty are now faculty of color. Administrators have changed, not just compositionally, but also uh, positionally. So the idea being that not only do we have African-American Latino leaders, they are vice presidents, there's our provost. They are the people that make decisions and where faculty and staff and students can see them as leaders, which is really important. That sense of belonging is not just for our students, it's also for our faculty. So thinking about faculty, in the classroom where students will spend a majority of their time, which is what they've come here for, understanding what faculty can do to support them is pretty critical. <clears throat> so one of the studies that we have done here on our campus, we asked students, we began to interview them and do focus groups, et cetera, to say, what is it that faculty do that either impede your learning or support your learning. And we've written a paper on this back in Goshen on that. And so what we found was that faculty can make 
a student feel welcome and that they can make it or they can diminish their accomplishments and make them feel unwelcomed or that they're not gonna make it. Again, faculty do the very best they can, but we also have to think about the fact that we need to teach. We're always in a learning process and having faculty be in a learning process with us is very critical. So we think a lot about kind of four areas. Culture, how is my culture being represented in the classroom? Am I being, am I being asked to speak for all Latinos or all this group or all that group? The climate, is the climate safe? Do I feel like I am going to be supported and respected in this classroom? That whole piece around uh, that is really critical, especially in times like this when our political and or cultural life in the, in the larger community is, is fraying and is being very challenging. That's important to look at. What, are the, what is the literature telling us? What are we learning from our students? The second, the third place was about classroom management. Does the faculty intervene when attacks or inappropriate messaging is going from student to student? It's really critical to do that. And the last one is this idea of, of um, seeing myself in the reflected in the material curriculum. Do I see people like myself? Are we reading diverse authors? Are we seeing people, other people groups represented in the great books? Those sorts of things. And finally, I think a lot, we've done a lot of work around this familial support. As those of us in higher ed know, we have this idea of a snowplow parent, right? We're always sort of afraid of those parents who kind of plow the way clear of all conflict, of all problems for students. That's not the case for Latino families, especially first generation students. What we found is that families can offer three things. They offer apoyo, which is support, consejos, which are stories, and then these cautionary tales. And what we found in the literature and in the work of researching this is that families, this kind of support you want. This is the kind of support that is meaningful to students. These families may not have gone to college themselves, know very little about education, but what they do is they know that their children can do better. So this cautionary tale is, I don't want you to end up like me in this working so hard, um, working for minimum wage, being stuck in the shadows, those sorts of things. And then consejos, these um, wisdom, this piece of wisdom, this knowledge, this thing that you can, uh, you can make it and that you can, um, that we give you advice. Those are the things that are really critical. Now that's the researcher part, but it's also a little bit of the practitioner part. So the last thing I would say is those are also places that you can research and we learn about that impact the practice of what we do. So at Fox, I am an administrator now. I don't think I ever shake off my researcher roots because I still try to keep in the field of research, but also I do it for a reason specifically to impact our practice. So as we look at the kinds of practices that we do in a university, we have to look outside at the community level. Um, the system around us is about what is happening in the world around us and how does that impact our students in the university. So if you think clearly about all of the issues this summer with race relations, et cetera, to come onto a campus and then to have no one mention it as if it didn't happen or to not even be asked, how are you doing, has been pretty problematic for our students. They feel disengaged, they feel unknown, they don't feel like they belong here. So really helping our faculty and others to begin to, to support our students by saying, what is happening in the world that is impacting you here? How do we support you? Having uh, leaders speak to these issues of justice, of social justice. Now, people would say that's a leftist perspective or uh, uh, you know, for us as a faith-based institution, a right-wing perspective. I, I don't think we can, we live in that tension, but we try to have a place of learning always. So at the university level, what are the policies? What does the literature tell us? What, is, what are our students telling us about how they're experiencing things that impact our policies, our practices, our programs, the culture that we try to build here and the finances that support all of these things. I'm always cautious to look at institutional budget, when people ask me to be on boards or be involved in something, I'll say where your money is, is where your heart is. That's kind of a biblical thing, but it's also uh, a good finance, a good understanding of organizations. So given those pieces, I would suggest to you that being both a practitioner and a, and a researcher are possible. And I would encourage you to think about those things. And our next slide, I will speak about myself a little bit. What is my role as a researcher and a practitioner? As a researcher, I believe in action research. So that's 
I'll start with that, the participatory research that I think is really critical because I partner with our community. I have not done research that doesn't include community members. So partnering with organizations that, that serve our community or members of a community with either interviews, interview questions that we're trying to ask, looking at the kinds of issues that they're dealing with. So there's a, a, a Native American saying that says nothing about us without us. So trying to live through that level in social justice research and research that is talking about people that matter, communities of color, first generation students, uh, communities that reflect immigrant populations, et cetera. It's really critical that we share power together it's not always about finance, but it matters a lot about finance. Do community organizations get paid for their work, for their help in helping us to find participants? Do they share power with us in deciding questions, in deciding process, in deciding where we're gonna do this research and how it's gonna go? These things are really critical. Truth teller. I think as a researcher, we think of ourselves as truth tellers. But understanding that nothing is uh, as unbiased as we'd like to believe. We come at it from our lens and our perspective, but it's critical to try to share the truth as our participants tell us without the lens of ourselves. And if we have that narrow lens, we've got to widen that out by asking, is this what you meant? How do we do that? One of the things that we have done, at, again, at Goshen was when we researched students of color, specifically Latino students who were in our program and um, much of the work we did was around their, their uh, experiences. We were very careful and always clear about telling them what we've learned. So we would have uh, research days where we would spend two or three hours just sharing with students, here's what we've learned about this. Is that fair? Is that accurate? And then we would tell them where we would present this data and what they were doing. And as much as possible, we would try to bring students along with us as, as co-presenters. It's really important to think about how do we co-present information about communities. Developing quote proof. I entered higher education for the explicit purpose of learning what I needed to do to get uh, approved programming so that I could actually continue to do work in my diverse community. It was really important because at that time in the late 90s, and early 2000s, it was very important that we get uh, what was called research approved or peer approved programming. And those were on a list from the federal government. And those were the only ones that programs that were being funded. It had very little available for communities of color at that time. And what we were finding was how do you make, how do you move culturally relevant, uh, make culturally relevant programming that still kind of makes the model keeps to the fidelity of the model, but is actually culturally appropriate for communities. And sometimes that stretch wasn't possible, so we had to create new things. So how do we create those new things and how do you then get them approved was this idea of peer-reviewed journaling, peer-reviewed peer work. That's one of the reasons I entered higher education. And again, as I mentioned, participatory, really thinking through who is part of our partners, the qualitative and the quantitative. Another way to say that is stories and numbers really important, but having the stories is, helps shape what the numbers tell us and have uh, give meaning to what we have. I don't think that's new to anybody, but if you're in, I just would reiterate, these are pretty both qualitative and quantitative are both important in research. So as a practitioner, it doesn't look much different. You partner with communities. It's nothing about us without us sharing power. Creating programs for people without people has been pretty, hasn't worked always very well. I started out very early in my career working with uh, a community and actually an OSU extension program. And that extension program we used to call, they would send out quote tofu, uh, tofu taco nurses. By that I meant nurses, nursing students who came out and were very adamant about trying to change the Latino communities, um, the immigrant communities eating habits. And so my dissertation is really on looking at that and how do you think about why, the, why that was not successful. In fact, why it was really problematic to try to change that. It didn't have to do only with the food or the nutrition of the food. It had to do with what was the meaning of the food. And so helping people to understand that a little differently and then to develop a different program that was run by the participants, by the community, for the community in ways that really mattered, meant that we as the leaders, as quote, the researchers and or practitioners took a back seat and began and did the work behind the scenes rather than in front. 
And those are really uh, different positions and it requires some humility, actually a lot of humility, and some ability to step back and not be the person in charge. Truth teller. Truth teller as a, re as a practitioner means you're telling truth to a lot of different people, including funders, sometimes your leadership. In fact, a lot of times as a chief diversity officer, my job is to tell the truth to people above me and to people around me. And it's not always the most popular job, but it is an important one. And as a researcher, you develop proof as a, re as a partner, as a practitioner, excuse me, you actually show the proof. And that leads to creating action, policies, programs, practices that hopefully positively impact the communities you're trying to serve. This is a little bit about what I've done and um, I'm happy to take questions in just a minute, but I wanna end with this last quote. If you would share the slide. I say to all of you who are students, who are thinking about uh, research as an industry or thinking of practitioners, or if you are a practitioner, you're needed in the field as both. In partnership with other participants and communities of study, we build trust and support. We need that now more than ever, I think. Research, science, all of it is under attack in our communities, in our country right now, in our world. And so what would it be like if partners who joined us, participants who joined us in research stood up and said, oh no, I know these people. I worked with them, I trust them. I trust what they've written because we were able to, to be part of that decision-making. We trust what they're saying. And so because we trust them, we will do the kinds of things that they're saying we should be doing programmatically to keep us ourselves safe, to keep our communities growing and thriving. What an amazing place that would be. So I would encourage you to say this, we can make positive changes for people whose voices we hear in our research, empowering others, empowering ourselves to understand and courageously make changes for the good of us all. That's what we do when we become practitioners and researchers. And I encourage that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for the wonderful presentation. Um, it's now time for questions and answers. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the bottom center of your browser window. While our audience is typing in their questions, I have one to get us started. So in your pre-seminar Q&A time, I noticed a topic that continued to come up was advice. You mentioned that you've taken a lot of advice from valuable mentors in your life, so my question to you is what is the best piece of advice you could give to an undergrad student like me? <laughs> That's great. When you think about what you wanna do for, in your studies, think about the impact you wanna make in the world. And I find that the world is not the world. The world is the place that you impact, the place that you wanna have influence, whether it's Oregon or somewhere else or it's education or it's, whatever field you choose to work in. Think about what you want to do and then begin to move toward that now, taking small steps. Nothing, think big, but start small. I think that's one of the biggest and best advice I, I received um, from many of my colleagues at OSU was, you know, big ideas, big plans, big goals and self injustice, but start small and then do nothing, nothing uh, done, uh, nothing great can be done alone. So find partners to help you out. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So our first question here is from Casey, and she says, uh, very recently, College of Public Health and Human Sciences announced that graduate programs in the college will no longer accept the GR as part of graduate application packages, and OSU no longer requires SATs for undergraduate admissions. Are you able to talk about standardized tests as structural barriers to college admission? and how applications can slash should be evaluated without these scores. Wow, that's not my area of expertise, but I remember my GRE not being that great um, and OSU still took me. So I, I applaud uh, that, that move. I think that's great. One of the things that standardized tests, we, we know from the literature that tells us that they inadvertently um, uh, are barriers for some communities of color, especially um, many students who have not, who have been unprepared perhaps for these things. It doesn't have to do with intelligence. It has to do with preparation or education levels. So I, we also don't 
uh, here at George Fox, we don't um, use those fully. In fact, we're going to get rid of them, I believe. And so one of the things that's really important is to think about how, what are we trying to really ask for, for students to, br to bring? What skill sets do we need them to come with? And how are the, what are the many ways that those can be demonstrated? So for example, leadership. In the past, leadership has always been about uh, an office or a position in a, in a school activity of some sort, or maybe an out of school activity. But the reality is for many of our communities, they're taking care of other siblings, they're working part-time, they're, um, they're interpreting for their parents at, at medical clinics or visits, all kinds of other ways of demonstrating leadership. And so thinking through about the multiple ways that we can think leadership, quote, leadership and define that and say, what are the multiple ways that we can demonstrate that and we can look for that? Those are the kinds of things that I think we're seeking more in our um, admissions processes and it makes us, makes us better for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So our next question is from Clara and she was wondering, what was one of the most valuable things you gained in your education at OSU? Well, Clara, as I said before, is my mentor and I absolutely adore her and I am uh, I'm here because of her. And so I really, first of all, thank you, Clara, for that. I think one of the most valuable things I learned and I learned from her and others is this, um, the fact that there is an unspoken uh, curriculum and, and we talk a little bit about that in education, the unspoken curriculum that other people seem to know and that for many of us coming in new, we don't know. And yet we have to learn that. So making, making the, um, the hidden visible, making the unspoken spoken and making, making that more equitable in the sense of why is that a value that someone has to quote bring, even though they don't know that they're supposed to be, they're not even in a race that they, they're in a race they didn't even know they were in. Mm -hmm. So how do we make those things much more fair and equitable and obvious? so that we actually can have, um, have lots more people be successful in that. And I think I learned that a lot from, from Clara and other faculty there and in me questioning them. As I said, I was an older student and um, I was a little bit more, I don't know, settled in my career and things like that. And so as I switched over to do this research um, degree, I was able to ask these questions because I'd experienced them before. And I think I would encourage uh, always to be asking ourselves, what are we putting out that is, quote, a, an expectation that's not spoken? We really need to challenge those things. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question here is from Casey. Um, how do you foster a culture that promotes a sense of belonging from a student to student, peer to peer level, rather than from a university and or faculty to student level? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're doing we're working on that now, like everyone else is. One of the things that we're working on here is about our commitment to civility and our commitment to care for each other as human beings. So um, again, as a faith-based institution, we um, say that every person is created in the image of God. And so you treat them with the respect and dignity um, inherent. And so that sounds good, but then how do you make that, turn that into practice? So we do trainings around this. We have very clear community standards around behavior, and then we call it out. And that's what I mean about classroom management. Having a student attack each other is not okay. And faculty need to teach and need to intervene in ways that are uh, respectful, but also uh, clearly demonstrate and model different kinds of behavior. So for example, if someone says something very, uh, maybe could be perceived as racist to someone else, it doesn't mean you call that person out and call them a racist, that student. What we say is a lot of times is, huh, that didn't sit quite, I, I don't know how others interpreted, but for me, that kind of didn't sit well. And it sounded like da 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 da. Is that what you meant? Mm -hmm. And giving that person the opportunity to correct that or not. And then saying, well, that has shut, that feels like it's shut down conversation. So let's, that needs to be set aside and let's restart. So it's really about helping students to learn the rules of engagement, as it were, teaching that and then practicing that. It's a hard thing to do, and in the the hotter the conversation gets, the harder it is to do in the moment. But it's something that we've got to get better at. And so here at at George Fox, we're committed to doing that kind of interaction with our students, training, etc. And um, we center that in our particular faith perspective. 
Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question here is from Allison. She says, I really appreciate your comments about equitable community partnerships and also serving as a academic or practitioner slash researcher. Can you talk about your top tips for building partnerships that lift up the expertise of the community? Yeah, uh, I had to learn that the hard way too. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important is to build relationships with people, right? And so what's been challenging for many researchers is that we think um, that we would go uh, just go and ask these communities to do such and such and we offer them a few, you know, 20 bucks an interview and they'll be thrilled to do it. That's not what they're interested in. It's interested in how do, what are they, what is it that they're for? They're built as an organization to build the health and the well-being of their community. So why, why would we as the big research organization, OHSU, which is where I used to work, or Oregon State or other schools, come in and just expect this to happen without building any relationship? So part of this is really, again, about going into other spaces and not expecting people to come into our spaces. You be the person that's uncomfortable for a while versus expecting people to always build that. I am bicultural, but others can be bicultural too. And that just means stepping into someone else's space respectfully and building and understanding and learning from them. And, if the, and then you learn what their interest areas are. And if it resonates with yours, then you can say, how would we feel about a partnership where it's equitable? And by that, I mean financial. It's got to be some financial compensation that's equitable, not, again, the $20 here and there. And then decision making. Who really gets to make decisions and how do we make decisions? And making all of that very, very clear up front. Uh, the worst thing we, I've had this happen as a community organizer or as a community um, member of uh, the leader of a community organization was the bait and switch and that you know what you can win this one but I'm never working with you again and so that that just gets really hard and you get a reputation so being very careful about that is important thank you yeah the next question here is from Dean Nieto um, and he says traditionally promotion and tenor in academia doesn't necessarily reward practice and outreach but research productivity in terms of publications and research funding how do you see academic institutions moving towards incorporating outreach and community engagement in the promotion process? Yeah, absolutely. We are very, very committed to this. And um, it, is a, it is a hard switch for sure. But I think one of the things that has begun to happen is to think about what, uh, what are the measures? So research has a financial measure that has come about. So we say, you know, you bring in X amount of federal dollars, et cetera. But what is the financial impact of bringing students? Our role in recruitment is very critical. So if we can help build relationships with those communities for the benefit of the university for future pipelines of students, Latinos are the fastest growing, continue to be the highest and the fastest growing population, right? Of potential. And the children in kindergarten today are three out of four are uh, diverse and mostly Latino. The idea is that this is a population that has a longevity to it. And so how do we then begin to measure differently and measure the things that, yes, it's financial, but bringing students and helping students to feel and to stay well, stay in the institution and to complete are critical. So retention is absolutely a part of what we are to do. So that any work that we can do and begin to change the measures for that work is absolutely something that we need to be paying attention to. It could be financial. It could also be long-term relational things. We just need to change the measures and we have the power to do that. Um, I, I always love when people say, oh, you know, that's how it's always been. Everything is, I think uh, Claire used to say this, everything's uh, traditional. I mean, it becomes historical after we stop doing it. So that's how historically they've done it, but now it's not done that way. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Larry. Uh, do you have <clears throat> any advice for instructors teaching in an online environment? What are some things they can do to make a positive difference with their students? Yeah, we're in the same boat <laughs> as everyone else in the country teaching online. So one of the things that we talked about is how do you build community online? And I think that's still possible. The, the key word is always relationships, right? How do we get to know all of our students? And I'm not teaching this semester, so I, I, I will own that, but I have taught in the past online. And, uh, and I've also have observed other wonderful faculty who are doing great jobs with this. One of the things that we've been really pushing hard is to, we have a be known promise that all of our students will be known personally. 
um, spiritually and academically. So one of the things that we have asked our faculty to do is to meet each student individually. Even though it's online, try to find a way to meet with them individually and get to know that student. Find out how they're doing. So doing surveys, individual, you know, on the chat or in a poll, a doodle, a, not a poll, but a, I can't remember the name of the poll, but some kind of poll, you know, did you, how did you receive this lecture today? What's happening? What, what are the things that are keeping you from succeeding? Those sorts of things. Our job is to help students be successful, not to weed out. And I, I, I think people disagree about that, but it doesn't mean that all, everyone can, you just feed them the answers. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you, we, the way we teach one way, this is the way I teach, is no longer acceptable. We have to find multiple ways of engaging students because we have multiple ways that students engage. So mm -hmm. how do we help do that? And that's our job as faculty. It's not up to our students, it's up to us. So I would say that building relationships, finding a way to, to get to know students one-on-one -on -one and also in groups is really important. So learning more about them and then doing a lot of check-ins as we go. And that's been really important for our faculty and they're finding that they can build community in that way, even online. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So this next question is from Taylor um, and it says, how did you come to see yourself as a researcher slash practitioner? Wondering about your origin story. What yeah. did you know or wonder about yourself that led you into your specific field? Oh, that's great. Uh, I'll start out with my, I was never, I was never thinking about a PhD, actually I never thought of a master's degree either. Uh, I, my parents were migrant workers that settled out in Idaho and then I went to school. I loved school. I've always loved school. Mm -hmm. but frankly, I'm the only one of my siblings who really did like it a lot. And so I'm the only one that went on to college. Um, I didn't know anything about, yeah, I didn't even know you had to pay to go to college. It was a shock when we got a bill at the end of the semester and we were like, what? And my parents were just <laughs> shocked. And then they said, oh, you better ask somebody. So I finally found out about financial aid. And anyway, it was a, everything was new and unknown. And I didn't know you could talk to faculty. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not so different from many, many students, whether they're white or Latino or, or black or others. If you don't know what you don't know, how can you ask? So that began my journey of saying, how do I help build bridges and, and bring barriers? I've always been interested in that. I've always done that just because I like to do that. My nieces and nephews will tell you I'm nosy and bossy and like to be in the business. And sometimes they'll say, can you stop talking to everyone? But I'm like, eh, I like talking to people. So that kind of began that. And then, I, as I mentioned, I was a practitioner. So I started out as a school teacher. Um, my first teaching job uh, was taught middle school and high school social studies. But I found that students couldn't concentrate on the schoolwork on the map of the US and the 50 states when they were hungry or when they were homeless or when they had other issues. And so I kept thinking, how do I help that larger thing? And so that brought me to being, to do a master's in admin, public administration at Portland State. And then that's about building programs and helping people to, so how do we help kids get fed and help have a home so that they can concentrate on school? And that just led me down the path of administration. So as I began to do more of this work, uh, actually I met Dr. Pratt working for Marion County. I was working for the Children and Families Commission and she um, encouraged me to get a PhD. And this is a cultural thing that I think, uh, if you don't know this, it's, it's sort of interesting. She kept asking me to the point where it was sort of, um, it, it would have been embarrassing to continue to say no. So I said, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. And then I said, I, I thought to myself, I'm gonna take the GRE, I'm gonna fail. I'll, she'll be so embarrassed for me, she'll never mention it, which is what you do, just you know, paper it over and it'll be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it, I passed and then I got scholarships. The next thing I know, I'm in grad school. And I was like, how did this happen? Okay, I'll do it. And then of course, my first semester, I didn't do very well at all because I was trying to work and go to school mm -hmm. full time. And I remember Dr. Pratt sat me down and said, look, you can be a researcher, you can be a, you can be a student, or you can be a, you know, an employee, but you can't do both. So I finally just walked into my boss's office and quit. Mm -hmm. um, and then freaked out because I didn't <laughs> come. And then Dr. Pratt helped me to get some scholarships a few days later, you know, a few weeks later, and that helped me to survive. And I did that for four years. And then, yeah, that's kind of how I started. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Um, this next question is from Suzanne and she says, how do you balance the needs, wants, demands of students as well as being a practitioner of the university? 
and then that of the community in regards to the university. How do I balance the needs of students and the university? Is that what the first part of that was? Um, how do you balance the needs, wants, demands of students as well as being a practitioner of the university? Yes, yeah. It's very hard. <clears throat> and as I become a more and more in administrative roles, as I uh, continue to do that, I find that it gets harder. Uh, I have to deliberately make space for engaging with students. So I, uh, like I mentor, I oversee, um, I'm the, the facilitator or mentor for Senior Mosaic, a group of students, but you know, behind on meeting with them, that sort of thing. Uh, I also try really hard to have, to create space in my calendar and my, and I have it on my, um, my response thing, it says make an appointment. So I, I just really live by a calendar. And so if I can meet students as much as possible, I, I frankly do a lot of calling people can call me on my phone I don't care text I keep up with students and I keep up with alums that way and just always am thinking who you know oh I see so and so huh because I have a my view right now if you, you can't see it but I look out onto the quad so I'm watching students as they walk by or and I'm doing reports and it's very I don't tell my boss but sometimes it's very boring <laughs> then, but I'm like oh there's a student I want to talk to so I'll have to reach out and try to make some time to do that so I, I work it's very hard and as a faculty member I know that there's this thing called the cultural taxation. Um, there was a great article in the Higher Ed Chronicle a few years ago about that and how that is very challenging. So I find that talking to faculty of color, we meet together, we talk a lot, is trying to make space and for writing and for their other work by making it part of their everyday schedule. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to do too. That's what Dr. Pratt showed me and others, Dr. Bowman, uh, Clara, um, Sally Bowman, Kate McTavish, you know, Karen Hooker, and my favorite person who helped me to finish my dissertation in the ways that were very, seemed hard at the time was, um, and she's, she, she died a few years back is Alexis Walker. And I, um, she was big on APA and always corrected my writing. So that's <laughs> Thank you. So this next question is from Sally. She says, what is your perspective about measuring knowledge against a universal standard versus the measuring that progress, the measuring the progress that a student has made based on the knowledge that they had when they entered a specific educational setting? Hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> people sometimes think that I mean, oh, we're just gonna, you know, quote lower standards or whatever. I, I always think of it this way. I don't want a nurse in my nursing, uh, and I've actually had this happen, it's quite embarrassing having a nursing student when I'm in the hospital, having to go, hey, how you doing? Hi, Sally. Um, oh, this is where you're doing your practicum. Sure, no problem. Uh, <laughs> and, there, you know, and that's not always fun, but I don't want Sally to have uh, not had the same training and incredible training and be the exceptional nurse that she can be. It's not about that. It's about can, and some students may take longer or shorter periods of time, but what is it that we can do to help the student along as far as possible? And there are some students who then themselves may make decisions about this may not be what I'm interested in doing or I can't do it. So it's not that we do a universal like this is the only way to teach. The standards may be the same for everyone, but the process of helping people to get there, that's where we have to open up our thinking. People mistake this is the way I teach or this is the way that people learn. They're not the same thing. And so it's up to us, incumbent on us to help find as many ways as possible to help people to learn, not for us to teach. It, does that make sense? It's not about us, it's about students. So refocusing has been really important. And of course you have standards. Like I said, I want a doctor who knows how to be a doctor. Um, but I also, but it also means I'd love a doctor who, like I had, like my father had when he was dying, who spoke Spanish to him, mm. who cared about him, who understood his culture because he himself was Latino. He was an incredible oncologist. He was an incredible human being an incredible comfort to my dad in those last days. And so that's who I want. And um, I think that's what many of us want. Thank you, yeah. This next question is from Carolyn and it's, how can we positively affect the social climate in a diverse classroom? For example, I gave a party to celebrate a couple of milestones for an Asian student and only the other Asian students came. Yeah. You know, one of the, that we struggle with that as well with the um, 
um, students, international students feeling very dis, um, disenfranchised or not connected to uh, majority culture students on our campus, or in fact, other students at all. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do is we're talking about and figuring out now and doing some work toward that is how do we incorporate our international students into, uh, since we can't travel and all of that right now, what are ways that we can actually take their expertise and ask them to be um, to help us to, to be part of learning for all of us, for well, not all of us, but in particular classes, et cetera. So that's part of it. And then the other part is that we, um, one of the hard things that we learned from an international student was that when students were allowed to pick their own study groups, when you say break out into small groups and do this assignment, that people only go to the people they know or they like, right? Or people mm -hmm. like themselves. That as faculty, we again have responsibility and have opportunity to um, bring people together who may not have always been together. But one of the things that's challenging is that we have to not only think about our own culture, but about other cultures. So for the Chinese student, one was trying to move forward and learning from other students. And so he was a little bit more forward going, but his social responsibility to his group was that he had to stay with them and help them, this Chinese student. He wanted a faculty member to say, you're assigned to this group and you're assigned to that group. And that began to help build those relationships. So again, introducing people together in, in uh, required ways is pretty helpful. And then thinking through about how then those small relationships come into building bigger relationships like classroom environments that are um, easily transferred into other places. One of the hard things is, one of the things we say around here is that we believe that diversity has always been part of God's plan from Genesis to Revelations in the Bible, or Bible, the Bible, that you, uh, we think that you can see it everywhere through the Bible that he, that God is about diversity. There's diversity within it, right? So God is not asking us to add on diversity. Like we just add it on to other things like, oh, that's a nice thing to slap on to everything curriculum and all this stuff, because we need those people to be happy, but rather he's asking us to join him in something he's already done. So our job is to keep up and to catch up and to, and to add um, ourselves into what has already been done and then move in that way. It's a little complicated, but the point is that it's not an add-on. So we have to be thinking through these things from the very beginning of how we plan our classes, not just at the end and say, oh, I see that kid's by himself. Shoot, I forgot about that. Let me mm. figure out how to do that. Mm. I'm not saying that's what you're doing, Carolyn. I'm just saying that many of us tend to do that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, this next one's from Beatrice and it says, Dr. Hernandez, thank you so much for your great presentation. It is so great to hear the promotion of the family support toward the students. I'm wondering what type of program supports are necessary to engage more students and families of color in high educational level systems. Yeah, I'll just give you some examples of some projects and um, places that we've done some work. And I would promote one conference, if anything else you, uh, get a chance to do. It's next week. Uh, it's expensive a little bit, but I think for students it's a little cheaper. It's the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, HACU. It's hacu.org. org. They have a conference that focuses on a variety of things, practitioners in the field as well as research. And so they'll have program, they'll feature concurrent sessions that'll have different programmatic things. We've presented there multiple times and it's just a really great conference. Um, when they have it in person, it's like 5,000 mostly Latino people together, and it just feels like a big, warm uh, family reunion sort of thing. It's very welcoming, and it's wonderful. But anyway, um, they'll be online next week, but that's a great place. They do Hispanic serving institutions is what they're mostly known for. That's what they work in. Anyway, all that to say, um, thinking about the kinds of programs that we do to involve families is thinking through admissions. What are the ways that we help bring families to campus? Most of our families don't know campus at all. So what are parent nights that we could bring families to campus? So they become used to uh, coming onto our communities, onto our spaces, although right now, of course, we're closed. But the idea of at other points, when are the ways that we bring families? So at Goshen, we actually started parent education classes. And the parent education classes was parent educating, educating parents on how to support their kids to go to college. So we started out with kids, and we had families, Latino parents, it was in Spanish, it was in the evenings, we provided childcare and food, and, uh, and it was taught totally in Spanish with the idea that says, here's 
no matter what age your students were, but then we began to sort of more narrow it down to middle school kids and then high school because we had a mix of people. And then we had some of our parents of our students that were um, part of our program come and be uh, answer questions as well. But we had a curriculum and we began to start that. That's still going on today. And Goshen, for example, is 30, is 42% Latino in their incoming class. And then we're, this year we're at 32% of our student population is diverse, most predominantly Latino. And um, of course we're much smaller than OSU, so you know, take that into consideration. <laughs> the idea that, that you begin to find ways to connect, again, a sense of belonging for families to see themselves as part, that this could be a future for their kid and for themselves to come do that. Mm -hmm. um, those are really important. We would do radio programs on um, Spanish language TV, um, mm -hmm. just a, a talk show, people could call in and we had a topic, but then we'd also have people call in and answer questions like what we're doing today. And those are really helpful for them to, to be able to talk to someone about it. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. um, this next question is from Corbin. And they were wondering if you have any books or podcasts or other resources that they can learn more and share with others. Sure. Ah, I'm always cool to do this. One of my favorite, believe it or not, is the Sage Handbook of Action Research. Yay, OSU. <laughs> there you go. I actually do have it. I still use it. But um, in terms of uh, researchers, you can just look it up, do a, a search on your um, a, a Primo or whatever you, you're using. Anything to do with all kinds of uh, Latino access, student access, diverse student access, those sorts of things. I'm not sure what they're asking specifically, but I've written a couple things specifically to faith-based institutions, and I do want to mention that. But this one is our latest book, Diversity Matters, Race, Ethnicity, and the Future of Christian Higher Education. Um, it's, it's a compilation of, I don't know, a lot of authors and um, just different pieces that we've done. Um, you know, it's kind of big, and I find most of these books are don't let the researchers, I mean, don't let the facility, uh, faculty members hear me say this, but you know, they're kind of like, they're kind of like um, recipe books, you know, you don't read the whole thing, but you read pieces that are really relevant to you in the moment. And then thriving in leadership strategies for making a difference in Christian higher ed. So again, these are specifically for Christian higher ed, but um, you can also Google, uh, not Google, research, um, find, excuse me, articles by lots of people. Torres, uh, Basti Torres has written a lot. Arbach has written a lot. Um, there's just a ton of authors that you can find on these things. Uh, we've also had some presentations. You can Google me, you can Google Robert Reyes, um, other place people like that. Yeah. Do your research, oh, you. your library facilities, use your library, let your librarians help you. you <laughs> True. Uh, thank you so much. That was our last question for today. Um, thank you all <clears throat> who have joined us today. <clears throat> oh, wow. uh, additional presentations are today at noon, 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. Pacific time. Our panel discussion with all 10 fellows and OSU's President Alexander is on Friday at noon. The schedule and previously recorded conversations can be found online at osualum.com forward slash fellows. Learn more about the College of Public Health and Human Sciences and the work they are doing in the community by liking their Facebook page or visiting their website. And Rebecca, I especially want to thank you and congratu congratulate you for being chosen as a 2020 Alumni Fellow. Thank you. Bye.